Right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Bryce Wakefield and I'm the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And uh, I'm coming to you from the lands of the Ngunnawal people here in Canberra. Well, um, it's been a couple of months now since the withdrawal of the United States and, and implicitly, I guess, allies from Afghanistan. And much of the focus here in Australia has, of course, I guess, uh, been on what it means for Australia. There have been moral questions, of course, about, um, about uh, bringing uh, those who helped Australia into our country as refugees. There have been dis there's been discussion on what uh, or whether the uh, withdrawal ind indicates some kind of willingness on the part of the United States to lend itself to its friends and allies in our region. What we discuss perhaps a little less is um, what it means uh, for the region itself. Um, perhaps we do talk about, for example, relations with Pakistan, but we haven't uh, really dug deep um, into what it means for relations in Central Asia, in uh, states like Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. So tonight we're going to balance that ledger somewhat and um, I'm going to do so with the help of some very accomplished speakers uh, from Australia and beyond. Uh, first up we're going to have Dr Shurat Baratov and he teaches at the University of Canberra and Australia National University. Um, he has a PhD in pol uh, pol political science and uh, international relations from the ANU and he also has a degree from the U University of Tsukuba in Japan. Uh, next, um, we're going to talk to somebody who has spoken to the Institute once or twice before. Her name is Dr. Raihan Ismail, um, and she's a senior lecturer at the Center for Ara Arab and Islamic Studies, also at ANU. Um, joining us from Sweden is Dr. Johan Engvall, and uh, Dr. Enfall is a Deputy Research Director at the Swedish Defence Research Academy. Um, he's also a Senior Fellow with the Central a Asia Caucasus Institute and Silk Road Studies Program. And we'll end up with uh, Dr. Kirill Norjanov, who is a Senior Lecturer and Convener of, convener of PhD Studies at the Center of uh, Center for Arab and Islamic Studies, also at the ANU. He's worked uh, uh, also on World Bank uh, funded projects and as the associate editor of the Asian Politics and Policy Journal. So to get us started, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Baratov. Uh, Shurat, if I may, can you take it away for us, please? All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. I didn't expect that you would start with me, actually. <laughs> so, um, yes, I think it is and um, it is um, quite good that we're having this event because in Australia, the focus on Central Asia, particularly the um, republics um, that are located in the north of Afghanistan, um, does not seem to be as high as other parts of the region uh, of the world. Um, so, yeah. Uh, since the withdrawal of um, US troops in Afghanistan and the rise of Taliban to power, um, some quite interesting dynamics have um, been observed in Central Asia. Um, and I think um, it is better if I put this in a, in a context of um, history when in the uh, 1990s, when Taliban came to power, the reaction of um, these Central Asian republics to the events um, were quite different compared to the 2021. So that tells a lot about how these republics have emerged ever since and how the great powers um, see um, this part of the region. Um, so yeah, I, I'll probably go a little bit into detail um, after probably I will we'll, we'll give the floor to other uh, speakers. So uh, my take on this would be um, that Central Asian republics reacted quite differently to the situation. Um, compared to 1996 when um, September 1996, um, if I remember correctly, uh, 26th, 27th of September, 
Um, the presidents of um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, plus Russian prime minister, they gathered in Almaty in an emergency summit. That was the um, reaction of Central Asians um, back um, 1996 to the rise of uh, um, Taliban to the uh, government. And uh, they secured Russia's uh, security guarantee and they adopted a joint declaration in 1996, which said that any action that undermines the stability on the border between Afghanistan and the CIS, it's a former Soviet Republic, um, republics, um, will meet an um, appropriate response. But this time around, we didn't have this kind of response. This, um, this time around, um, the reaction was quite uh, diverse. For example, I, my take is that Uzbekistan, for example, was more prepared to uh, the Taliban ruled Afghanistan compared to, for example, Tajikistan, which looked, um, the government of which looked like um, panicked a bit um, in, in that situation. Um, the reason is that I think the perception of these um, countries of Afghanistan has evolved significantly over the last 20, 30 years. Um, Uzbekistan, for example, these days sees Afghanistan as a, as a trade partner or um, uh, actually as, as a transit route compared to 1990s when it was a pure security threat to the nation's um, uh, uh, government uh, regime, as, as when I put here, or overall the um, stability of the country. So I think I'll go into details after we, we give floor to uh, other speakers. I think before going into details, it's probably a better idea to go over um, how some uh, big countries reacted to this. All right, um, fantastic. Um, we'll uh, turn next to Raihan. Um, Raihan, you're going to address the 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 uh, the issue of political Islam in the region and whether it has an impact on the um, the politics of the states that we're following here today. Thank you so much, Rice, for inviting me. Um, I must say. And I have to say this very clearly, I'm not an expert on Central Asia. And I was asked to talk about Islam and political Islam, and my work really looks at the Middle East. Um, I usually look at how Islamism operates and Islamist ideological transformations. I look at uh, Sharia law in various parts of the Muslim world and how these laws are practiced and interpreted in various parts of Muslim societies. So. What I'm hoping to do here, I hope it's going to be relevant in the context of um, discussing Central Asia, but basically looking at the Taliban as an Islamist movement that subscribes to Islamist ideals um, and perhaps explaining and understanding Islamism a bit more in the context of the Taliban, um, Islamist in broad terms place Islam and the interpretation of Islam at the heart of their political identity. And for Islamist, Islam is meant to govern political actions and will be incorporated into the groups as political, economic and social agendas for governance. So the question is, um, will the Taliban revert back to pre-2001? And that's something that uh, many have asked. Um, where the Taliban government prevented women from going to school, and we all know this, where women were prevented from working, um, and they imposed a strict version of Sharia law where amputations, beatings, public executions were the norm. So we also know that for 20 years, um, the group continued their fight to regain power through launching a consistent and unfailing insurgency. And now that they're back in power, the games have also changed significantly. Um, they have to contend with moving from an insurgency to governance. They have not governed for 20 years. Um, they've also inherited, as we all know, a humanitarian crisis and a disastrous economy ravaged from years of corruption, COVID-19, as well as weak state institutions. So the changing nature of Afghan society is also a problem for them, particularly in urban areas, especially the changing roles of women and youth, dealing with groups like ISIS-K. And the leadership has to also deal with the militants on the ground. 
Um, and there are thousands of them. And one question remains is that, will these militants be repurposed? And here we are referring to battle-hardened militants who, according to analysts, are ideologically committed more so than the Taliban leadership. So what the, the question that I wanted to look at is whether or not they are different and have, you know, they have now changed. Um, the groups as top leaders espouse their commitment to allowing women to go to school and to work. And they have also appeared on Western media outlets urging cooperation with other countries. And they are also showing their desire for an international recognition. So it can be argued then that the Taliban's leadership is transitioning from a purely violent Islamist group like Al-Qaeda and ISIS to an Islamist group that does not completely reject the international political order and has shown willingness to be part of that political order. And I think this is relevant in the context of um, other countries within the region as well. And one could argue that the leaders are modeling themselves on nonviolent Islamist groups for acceptability purposes. But the question again remains, are they capable of changing? And this is where the literature on Islamism may be helpful to theorize or understand groups like the Taliban. And there are two views when it comes to non-jihadi Islamist groups that participate in the political process and crave international recognition. The first view that is not very sympathetic argues that these groups will never change. Um, Islamist ideology is at the core of their thinking. They will make compromises, but not enough to protect minority groups as well as women. And they will implement Sharia law. And in the case of the Taliban, they are likely to continue to implement the interpretations of Sharia law, which is radically different from and more rigid than other Muslim societies. And the second view states that ideology is not a straight jacket. And Olivier Roy argues that Islamists are shaped by politics and not the other way around. And therefore, their social political circumstances shape and mold their behavior. And other scholars who look at Islamism um, argue that the political environment of these groups is crucial to understand how they operate and continue to operate. So the jury is still out. I mean, we are yet to see the Taliban is capable of changing, but we also have to look at the reality on the ground. I would say, um, do you engage or do you not engage? And the US disastrous withdrawal, and in the words of um, Professor Bill Maley, you know, a botched operation in Afghanistan has allowed the Taliban to control the country in a decisive and swift manner in which they withdrew gave no room for inclusive governments to be formed. So now they are consolidating their position and it is also happening very fast. Um, again, one question that is asked and has been consistently asked, does the international community ensure the protection of women and minority groups, um, including the ethnic Hazaras and Sikhs who are no doubt being targeted by both ISK and Taliban militants, um, and this is very hard, especially considering that the Taliban just replaced the Women's Affairs Ministry with Ministry for the Propagation of Virtue and the Prevention of Violence. And I would say, to conclude, there are three suggestions that I would float out there for further discussion, and particularly in the context of reg um, I mean, uh, uh, regional partners as well. Um, I think you know, it's an in these are interesting suggestions um, to be discussed, perhaps. One, tying humanitarian aid to human rights. Um, one way is to look at the EU and the pressure they are imposing on the Taliban's leadership to address human rights <laughs> issues in exchange for humanitarian aid, in which the country needs badly. Um, however, some scholars argue that tying humanitarian aid to human rights may prevent uh, or present some ethical questions as well. So the second question is tackling the disparity between, or suggestion is di tackling the disparity between the leadership and the militants on the ground. Um, if the leadership, which is not a monolith, is willing to compromise, how do you then deal with the militants? And definitely this is a difficult task. Um, some, something that the Taliban continues to deal with as well. But having said that, these militants also adhere to a religious hierarchy. 
the spiritual leader, although from all accounts, you know, socially conservative, may have the religious authority to rule in favor of protecting women and minority rights. As I've mentioned earlier, when Islamists make compromises, the compromises will be rationalized within the framework of religion so that they still seem committed to their Islamist ideology. I actually saw an interview with Malala Yousafzai yesterday, and she made, in my view, a very good suggestion. And according to her, Muslim leaders, especially religious scholars, need to engage with the Taliban to change their views, especially considering how receptive the leadership has been in trying to gain recognition. Bringing them into the Sunni fold may moderate their positions on women's education. And women's education up to the highest level is a universal right. And the overwhelming majority of Muslim scholars do not prohibit women from going to school except for the Taliban. And finally, um, perhaps uh, protect and support those who are most vulnerable through evacuation, more visas for Afghan refugees. And today we heard that an Afghan interpreter working for the ADF was murdered. So that's the very least we could do is to support uh, those who supported us. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. <laughs> that was great. Um, let's uh, move now to uh, Dr. Engfall. Um, Johan, can you, uh, can you give us your uh, opening remarks, please? Sure, thank you very much. And thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, let me try to pick up on these two points that the previous two speakers were uh, made. Um, first, maybe I will talk a little bit about how 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 this region is different today than compared to to 25 years ago, as uh, Shukrat uh, talked about. And also, maybe I'll give some remarks also on on the basis of religion, but then more with a focus on 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 the five Central Asian republics or the situation there. Uh, but let me say there, in, in, as a rule, you know, for instance, in Sweden, where I come from, in the general news reporting, you, you can always see that these um, Central Asian countries, they are often, you know, lumped together, you can say, as the stands and uh, typically often described as uh, weak and corrupt and authoritarian. Yeah? Um, and sometimes you of, often also get the impression that this is seen as a kind of a black hole or non-government space here. But I would say that so much of these descriptions and that um, of the region, uh, in a way, in, in general media, it falls back on, on the idea that this region has been more or less constant in a way since the 1990s. And it can be analyzed in the same way as back then. Uh, but then, uh, as uh, Shukrat mentioned, also a lot has happened in, in Central Asia over the past decade. Uh, I mean, it's a region that is rapidly changing. Um, but there's also a significant, I would say, a regional variation here where the states are becoming increasingly different from, uh, from one another after this period of streamlining during the 70 years of um, being part of the Soviet Union. But compared to the last time that the Taliban ruled uh, Afghanistan, the Central Asian republics today, they have significantly strengthened their, their identities and consolidated their, their states although under rather strict authoritarian political systems, but nonetheless, you can also see that they have a much stronger now uh, monopoly on the use of violence in society and their armed forces, they're also stronger and, and uh, centrally controlled. And you can also see that compared to, to the 1990s here, where they were grappling with finding their places in, in the international system and, and all that, they, they are now much more at ease with, with um, dealing with different institutions, international institutions and, and other countries. Um, and you also can say that an interesting aspect in the, in the past years also you can see of this growing self-confidence in the region. You can also see that the regional kind of identity has been strengthened also in, in recent times. Uh, this type of competition and mistrust um, are increasingly actually being replaced, at least by attempts uh, to have some cooperation or coordination uh, on these matters that are of importance to the region. But you can, of course, still see that there are points of tensions as manifested by the border conflict between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan this spring and, 
and, and so on, yeah. Uh, but I would say that in the region then, from a domestic perspective, the main problems I would say they are jobs, poverty and, and corruption. These are the things that, and I think that comes in a little bit on this aspect with religion. Of course, there are concerns uh, for the Central Asian Republics in relation to the, to the Taliban's return to power in, in Afghanistan. Um, and of course, the role of religion here, uh, uh, specifically than Islam uh, in this society, it's very clear that it has been growing considerably in, in recent decades. And I think you can see this also as a part of the search for, for identity and context in, in societies where this uh, so Soviet uh, socialist project, it doesn't lo no lo it, it does no longer um, since a long time ago, it doesn't bind together its, its citizens. And then you can see that religion has become a, an increasingly important uh, identity marker. I would say this is especially true among the, the gen, uh, younger uh, generation here of, of Central Asians. Uh, but then you also see that this legacy of Soviet uh, atheism uh, means that there is some kind of discontinuity here in, in these strong religious traditions to fall back on. So you can very much see that this ongoing Islamic re revival here is um, extremely dynamic and it mixes uh, the various national religious character characteristics here with, with the outside influences, um, could be from the Arab world or, or Turkey or and Pakistan also. Um, so, but even if these societies are becoming increasingly religious, uh, the, the systems of government here in, in the region remain strictly secular. And you can see that religion is very strongly subordinated to the state, legislation, justice systems, also education systems, they are based on these uh, secular principles, uh, not Sharia law. Uh, and of course, this is in strict contrast then to the more religiously hardline Taliban movement. Uh, and the problem here is, of course, that given that we still do not know exactly what this type of, this uh, version of the Taliban rule will, will come to look like, it is, of course, understandable that, that the fears here among the Central Asian states is that uh, Afghanistan once again will, will become a haven for, for extremist organizations, either by attracting also religiously radical elements from, from Central Asia, or that um, this type of more radical political religious views, you can say, these IDs, uh, more will, will also could spread and, and gain a foothold in Central Asia because there are certain segments of society I would say that could be supported of of such ideas uh, in some especially marginalized people I talked about these aspects of corruption and poverty and, and this type of uh, unjust um, aspects of, of the governance systems here that is something that that um, can lead to some uh, support for, for more radical ideas. And th this is something that they fear in the, in the region, I would say. Um, but I, I I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, opening comments from Dr. Norzhanov. How do you? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, please take it away. Sorry. Thanks, Bryce. And, uh... Yes, I'm uh, wary of the time, so I'm going to confine my remarks to just one international actor operating in the context of Afghanistan, and this is Russia. And I believe it's uh, appropriate because uh, right about now, a major international conference is uh, starting in Moscow, the so-called Moscow format meeting, uh, where a senior delegation of the Taliban government at the deputy prime minister level is uh, meeting with the Russian hosts and uh, nine other uh, nations are also represented at these talks, including all five Central Asian uh, republics. So this is a fairly major event uh, that is going to uh, change the international landscape quite considerably, because this group of um, uh, leaders participating in the Moscow format uh, seem to be quite pragmatically, if not warmly disposed towards the Taliban, and they're quite ready to make a deal of sorts uh, with the new government in Kabul. Uh, which is more than can be said about the collective West, Australia, the United States, uh, as we saw last week during the G20 uh, conference. So what is Russia up to and uh, how does it position itself in Central Asia vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and the Taliban? I think it can be all summarized uh, very neatly in one sentence that uh, Russia cares only about one thing, and this is its own national security. 
Uh, Bryce mentioned in his introduction that um, in uh, the West, in Australia, the discussion on the Taliban and Afghanistan is often based on the so-called moral dimension. Um, uh, from my observation on what has been going on uh, in Russia, this moral dimension is completely missing from the equation. Uh, the uh, Russian officials simply do not care about the plight of women or the minorities or uh, the killing of uh, former allied personnel in Afghanistan. Uh, it just doesn't concern them. What concerns them uh, is uh, really two things. The first thing is that uh, for the Russians, uh, the Taliban must continue their fight against the Islamic State, uh, Khorasan province, which is um, enemy number one for uh, Moscow. And uh, the second point is that uh, the Taliban uh, should uh, desist, should make sure that uh, there is no spillover into Central Asia of any kind of instability or radicalization because Moscow views Central Asia as a zone of its uh, privileged interests, security interests. It's a soft security underbelly of Russia. So if the Taliban play the game, if they uh, kill enough uh, turban-headed hooligans from uh, ISKP, and if they make assurances, ironclad assurances, that uh, uh, nobody will uh, come from the territory of Afghanistan to pollute the air in Central Asia or to radicalize uh, uh, young impressionable youths in Central Asia that uh, Johan uh, talked about uh, so eloquently, then no further questions will be asked. Uh, so uh, Putin is on record saying we're not quite ready to recognize the Taliban officially, but we are certainly preparing to uh, delist them from uh, uh, the cohort of uh, terrorist organizations. So thus, if all goes well, at the meeting in Moscow and uh, the Taliban deliver on the end of the bargain, it's only a matter of time before um, there's some kind of working relationship established between uh, the Kremlin and the Taliban government in Kabul. Um, what it all means in the context of Central Asia. Uh, I uh, really appreciated Shukra's comments. Uh, again, uh, back in 1995, Boris Yeltsin could pretend to be the universal provider and protector for wobbly uh, newly born Central Asian nations. Things have moved on considerably since then. Uh, all uh, five stands are now self-assured, very competent, very experienced nations. And it's up to them really to agree or disagree with the Russian line. And uh, uh, clearly, Uzbekistan uh, has decided to deal with Afghanistan on its own volition. Uh, it uh, rebuffed Putin's attempts to impose the uh, sweet charms of the Collective Security Treaty Organization and uh, a military umbrella for Uzbekistan. But on the other hand, countries like uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan said, well, we welcome the Russian presence, the more the merrier. And Russian troops have been drilling on the territory of uh, Tajikistan in particular nonstop since mid-August this year. Um, so in the round, to round it up nicely, and again, I um, uh, appreciate the comments from all my uh, colleagues. Uh, um, uh, what uh, strikes me about the behavior of the Central Asian nations and keeping in mind that uh, what things I said about Russia is that uh, they're quite close actually to the Russian outlook on the Taliban. They're pragmatic. It's their livelihood, it's their own security that is at stake and that they do not have a moral compunction not to deal with the Taliban. And the Shukrat probably know better, but uh, the, uh, very, the, the visit of the foreign minister of Uzbekistan to Kabul to parley with the uh, Taliban was a big event. And the Kazakhstan sent a high ranking delegation and, uh, to build bridges with the Taliban. So in some respects, the Central Asian republics are uh, going in even further than Russia to uh, strike some kind of uh, quid pro quo based relationship, step, stopping this short of formal recognition of the Taliban. Uh, so that's uh, the final comment here would be that uh, as far as the United States and its allies are concerned, uh, they should really take on board what's happening on the ground and not try to impose their quite uh, dramatic vision, ideologically driven vision of the Taliban upon Central Asians. Uh, it's a dead end and the Russians are much more savvy and nuanced in this regard. Uh, thank you.
Okay, f fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Now, I was remiss in um, not mentioning to everybody that, of course, if you would like to ask everybody out there um, in Zoom land, if you would like to ask a question, please just go ahead and uh, plonk it in the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. The upvote function is turned on. So if you see a vote, you know, the thumbs up, um, if you see a vote you like, click on the, uh, if you see a comment you like, click on the thumbs up and the best comments or the, the most popular comments will float to the top where I will choose to answer the, ask them or not. Um, one, I, 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 I've got a burning question as somebody who's a complete novice in this, this area, but somebody who focuses quite a lot on East Asia, um, the, the elephant in the room that Australia always talks about doesn't seem to be present at the moment, and that's China. Um, China is a regional actor. It does have uh, <laughs> concerns, let's say, about um, its, uh, its, its own ethnic uh, uh, Arab, uh, or, or Islamic population in the region. Their reaction to those concerns are causing concerns in Australia and elsewhere, one has to say. Um, it was uh, reported widely in, in the West and including in Australia that um, China was quick to acknowledge uh, the new government uh, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, I guess, um, Kirill, this would probably be one for you, maybe. Um, uh, is, there, is there a game going on here? What's China's, what's China's role? Is there a... Um, I mean, there are... We we might be, we might be able to see sort of economic blocks forming between China and um, Russia because we have different uh, economic mechanisms. We have what the Shanghai Cooperation um, Organization and the Eurasia Economic Union active in the region. Do we see a cooperative relationship between uh, China and? Uh, and Russia, or is there competition going on? For example, Paul Elva, who's a um, who is a an intern here, asks, for example, what role could you see Russia, China, or even America, so great powers, playing in solving border disputes such as in the Fergana Valley? Right? Is there a is there a constructive role? Is there a competitive role? Um, what sort of game is China playing, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia here? Uh, thanks, Bryce. Uh, that's actually a series of uh, very interesting questions. I'll try to be brief. Uh, cut me uh, in, please, if you think I'm becoming too verbose. So um, I actually cringe every time I hear the um, word combination, the great game, because comparisons with the 19th century geopolitical, geopolitical competition are quite misplaced. Uh, there are too many new actors and uh, local countries have agency unlike the 19th century. There are non-governmental actors all pulling in uh, their own direction. So reducing everything to geopolitical competition, so zero-sum game uh, for the sake of control of the heartland, to use Halford McKinder's uh, uh, term, it's, it's uh, nonsense. So specifically about China, just like Russia, I don't really see uh, China moving to fill the so-called geopolitical vacuum. It's a construct by uh, the US think tankers, uh, Heritage Foundation, and uh, uh, probably some other right-wingish neocon-like uh, think tanks. Uh, the Chinese agenda in uh, Central Asia, in terms of uh, the Afghan issue, is uh, again security-driven. It's the Uyghurs, uh, the Chinese want one thing primarily uh, to achieve in Afghanistan, and this is to make sure that uh, Islamic radicalism slash um, uh, Uyghur separatism do not percolate into the Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region. And as early as 2013, actually, the Chinese were gently negotiating with the Quetta Shura of the Taliban. And uh, today, uh, such negotiations continue quite in the open. And uh, that's uh, what China wants. Uh, all this talk about China laying its greedy hands on the untold mineral riches of a Afghanistan or building railways and highways in Afghanistan. Uh, this is a pipe dream. This is not happening. China's uh, agenda is um, defensive. Uh, in terms of uh, China's um, uh, cooperation or um, uh, competition with Russia, again, it's very much a Western construct. Uh, I haven't seen a single episode, actually, of disagreement between uh, uh, Russia and China. 
it's a condominium in Central Asia. It's a complementary relationship. So the Chinese are looking after the economic side of development in Central Asia. The Russians are the security providers. And the Chinese are extremely careful not to transgress on the territory marked by the Russians. So the final point about um, uh, growing China's political clout and its uh, possible involvement in uh, resolving conflicts in the Fergana Valley, uh, Johan is uh, much better qualified to talk about this, but uh, the Chinese do not want this. Uh, to put it in simple terms, they uh, pursue the policy of uh, neutrality. Uh, all they want is to maximize profits and to carry through the BRI, and only, it, it is only in the context of BRI that they may become involved really nearly just to make sure that uh, the infrastructure projects do not face uh, uh, unwarranted political security uh, risks. So I wouldn't demonize uh, China. I would certainly seriously question predictions of an inevitable China Russian rivalry in Central Asia. Okay, great. Um, Johan, your name was mentioned there. Do you have anything to, uh, to add to that? Yeah, I think I agree with most actually what Kirill said there, but maybe I would just emphasize that um, um, when you think of, of this aspect of, of agency, I would say that uh, Kirill mentioned now that, you know, <laughs> it's very common that we think about uh, this region and when you talk about the great game, you think about very realistic type of, you know, that these countries are some kind of billiard balls that uh, uh, different, you know, great powers can can push in different directions and all that. But uh, uh, I would say that today these these regional states they are highly active players here and really shaping this dynamic uh, themselves here in the region. They have been quite apt at, you know, using also for the, for in their own state building and and the political development and economic development. Um, uh, projects that they use these different international uh, organizations that are present here. You, you mentioned several of them here in the beginning, <clears throat> uh, but also these different powers, they, they get security from, uh, from Russia, they can, they might make, they get these infrastructure investments from, from China, but they also seek from others. And there's also an interest there, of course, in, in, in to have relations with the West. And there are things that, that, um, China and Russia might not be so willing to give, yeah, but but that, that, that are in the bond here that could be with education or these smaller things, yeah, even if it's difficult to, to but but this is something they actively seek themselves. So I think it's an important to to then work with with this and not make deals above their heads in a way, yeah, with, with trying to reach some agreements with, with Russia. There have been some talks now about some kind of US, for instance. Um, um, response uh, using ba bases in, in, in Central Asia that the Russians would grant them. The Russians are here basically talking for these states, but this is not, I don't think, the kind of relations they want. They are very uh, keen on, on, uh, on really, you know, using this type of, uh, I know Kirill has written about this excellently in the case of Tajikistan, but it's really about this multivectoral um, foreign policies, security relations that they seek. They seek to balance these different uh, actors and in that process also strengthen their own um, benefits and, and sovereignty in, in, in this um, region. Thank you. Good. Does anybody else want to have a go on that question before I move on? Okay. Well, the next one's for, um, for Raihan and um, uh, it's from from Zanthi Merrill, another uh, another intern here, um, <clears throat> and I think actually your student, isn't she, Raihan? Um, uh, uh, so the question is, uh, if it, it's about it's about whether or not the, the Taliban, I guess, can can uh, can act as a model. I think um, so. She's asking, do you think that the Taliban will become a leader in the Muslim world? if the Taliban demonstrates a willingness to cooperate with the international order in order to gain legitimacy, will this send an influential message to extremist groups across the world and across the region that Islamism must be moderated in order to gain legitimate power? Or um, is the converse true if the Taliban decides to maintain its more extreme interpretation of Islamic law 
and politics will this in turn spur Islamist groups in the region to continue to push for a strict Islamic state? Thank you very much, Bryce, for summarizing the question. And also, Santi, for asking the question. She's a very good student, by the way. I have to say that to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her in my course. Um, so in terms of the Taliban, I would say that it is very difficult to see the Taliban assuming the leadership of the Muslim world. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. One, Muslim authority is fragmented. Religious authority is fragmented. Um, in Sunni Islam, you have different schools of thought. You also have different schools of thought in Shia Islam. Um, and you have two different sects as well. And Muslim countries would um, highlight their superior interpretation of Islam. Egypt, for example, boasts to host uh, Al-Azhar University, which is seen as the bastion of Sunni Islam. They have their own interpretations of Islam, which contradicts um, what the Taliban um, wants to do. Uh, the idea of creating an Islamic Emirate and so on and so forth is very much um, in violation of what other Muslim scholars think. So I think in terms of assuming the leadership of the community, of the broader community, it's very difficult to see. Um, the second reason, I'll try and be very, very quick as well. The second reason is the Taliban's interpretations of Islam. Um, it is often associated with extremism. I think even the Saudis reject the Taliban's interpretations of Islam. I mean, the Saudis initially supported the Taliban, recognized the Taliban when they came to power, but when the Taliban refused to hand over Osama bin Laden in 1998, the Saudis cut funding and cut ties with the Taliban. So obviously there's a lot of bad blood there. Um, and for the Saudis, the Taliban is not really a, a trustworthy entity. I'm not sure about now, but I think Turki Al Faisal recently really um, iterated um, Saudi Arabia's you know, disdain for, for the Taliban or any lack of support for the Taliban. Um, whether or not that, you know, their actions will inspire um, um, jihadi groups, I would say it might inspire some Muslims who are very critical of the West, particularly Western interventions in Muslim societies, maybe not uh, subscribe to the Taliban's interpretations of Islam, but um, admire the Taliban for their um, ability to defeat Western countries and in the US and also uh, US allies. So you see a lot of celebrations in some parts of the Muslim world, including the Arab world, where um, some Islamists in particular praise the Taliban's ability to defeat the US. Um, for groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, I would say that whether or not they're going to start you know recognizing international political order to be seen as legitimate and come to power i find that very difficult um and i think it's because of the nature of these groups ideologically they reject the international political order the main aim of groups like isis and al-qaeda is to destabilize western countries and western allies to allow for the establishment of the caliphate so at least that's the main goals of these um you know, terrorist organizations. And the Taliban is definitely moving away from that. Um, yesterday, or was it yesterday? I can't remember, a couple of days when um, ISIS gave bomb the Shia mosque um, in Afghanistan, um, the Taliban spokesperson actually mentioned ISIS there as a khawarij. Uh, and I find this fascinating, um, basically arguing um, that ISIS is an extremist group. The term Khawarij is used by various uh, Muslim scholars to denounce extremist groups. And here you have the Taliban saying that we're not like ISIS, we're not Khawarij, we're very different. And I find that really quite um, interesting to see how the Taliban is actually trying to move away from groups like ISIS. They haven't said anything about Al-Qaeda, but certainly um, ISIS would be um, you know, denounced by, by groups like the Taliban. I hope I've answered that question. Thank you for the great question again. That's great, and none of you really need to say that you're going to uh, you're going to keep things short because we we do like you know involved discussion here. Um, I I did have a question that that's sort of going to percolate into another one here from Jake Murray, um, and it's it's Jake's question is to to Dr. Baratov, but a lot of you have actually said. Um, or have actually mentioned that there's a tendency to group these uh, the five stands, I guess, together. Um, but I mean, they are 
they are different uh, entities, different nations, and um, there are different levels of, I guess, uh, strength when it comes to secularism in particular. Um, so again, you know, I'm, I'm by no means an expert here, but my understanding is that Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan are, are more sort of developed and secular, if you like, whereas Uzbekistan and, and Turkmenistan, maybe not. I wonder, um, um, I wonder if you could frame this next question, um, Shurat, in the context of those comments. You were speaking about the preparedness of Central Asian republics for the rise of the Taliban and how it differs from last time they came to power in Afghanistan. How do you think these states will interact with this new neighboring power? Yeah, um, I think um, winter is about to start in that part of the world and, Af and, and Taliban will need aid plus some trade, I'm assuming. And, uh, Central Asia is going to be quite important for Taliban, especially, I think, Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan's trade is well ahead compared to other nations of Central Asia with Afghanistan. Um, I'm not sure about the figures right now uh, with, with the Taliban government, but um, with the Ashraf Ghani government, there have been quite a lot of agreements, and Uzbekistan has been building a lot of infrastructure in Afghanistan, including railway. Um, of course, the main purpose here is Uzbekistan's own national interest, which is transition through Afghanistan to Pakistani ports and access to the world market. But I'm assuming that um, Pakistan, um, Afghanistan also will benefit quite a lot from this. And, uh, and this is a significant change compared to, as I said, 1990s, where um, these nations were not um, sure what to do with the Taliban government. And I think this time around, um, especially Uzbekistan, is um, quite ready to trade. And there are some uh, reasons uh, to say that in July 15, I think it's one of the unnoticed um, agreements that was reached between Pakistan and Uzbekistan. So this time around, I think Uzbekistan is talking to Taliban and to, Af um, to Pakistan openly about uh, the, the um, securing of the trade routes that Uzbekistan so far has established through Afghanistan to Gwadar port of Pakistan. So it's a document called Joint Declaration on Strategic Partnership between Uzbekistan and, and Pakistan. So this is a rare event, I think, for, for Central Asian Republic to sign this kind of agreement with Pakistan. And I think this is a quite pragmatic move by Uzbek government to, to, to ensure that whatever they have achieved so far in terms of trade relations with Afghanistan is secured. So assuming that and Pakistan has some influence over Taliban, uh, they can guarantee some sort of... Um, security for the transit of um, um, trade cargoes through um, Afghanistan. In, in, I think between March and May, I can't remember exactly what month was that, um, some Uzbek and Pakistani joint effort was made to dry run some, some uh, cargo through um, Afghanistan uh, from Guadalajara to Tashkent to see how long does it take, how, what's the economic feasibility. So it was just a, a dry run and to see how uh, feasible the project is and I think they were quite happy with that so they would like to continue that. Um, so the, the bottom line is um, Uzbekistan is going to be quite important for the Taliban government in terms of it will continue its infrastructure projects which are funded by Asian Development Bank as soon as these international institutions start funding uh, I think it's just a matter of time I'm assuming. Um, in terms of uh, Tajikistan I don't have too much information about Turkmenistan. In terms of Tajikistan, I think um, Tajikistan is quite in, a, in a, a bad situation when it comes to their relations with the Taliban at this time of the point, because very recently they announced um, the, uh, the uh, late uh, leader of the uh, Northern Alliance, uh, Ahmad Shah Masood, as a Tajik hero. So Tajikistan is still trying to keep um, establish or keep its links with the ethnic Tajik minority in Afghanistan which is one of the forces that are fighting against um, the Taliban. Whereas Uzbekistan has given up this relationship already. Uzbekistan is not supporting any Uzbek force there. There used to be a general called General Dustum in 1990s. So he was still in the government, in Ashraf government. Um, but at this time, it is only, I think, Tajikistan, which is uh, having some hope in terms of keeping its relationship with ethnic groups in Afghanistan. And I think um, that is not what, the, uh, what some... Um, um, Taliban groups, um, uh, factions within Taliban, uh, not liking. So they openly, I think they openly made a statement that if, Talib, if Tajikistan continues um, interfering into Afghanistan's affairs in a way that they're doing now by supporting some ethnic groups there, 
um, or at least um, you know, uh, um, building on the hope that some Tajik groups might can't come to power. Um, Taliban will turn Tajikistan into Afghanistan's province. So it was, I can't remember exactly what faction of Taliban said that, but this was an open statement. So yeah, um, um, I'm not sure about, maybe other um, speakers will be able to comment on Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan's position on that. But as far as I can tell, uh, um, it, Central Asia is going to be quite an important trade partner for the Taliban ruled um, Afghanistan in the near future. Yeah, that's my take on this. Uh, that's what happens when you're at home and you don't have a have a <laughs> have an assistant to help you. <laughs> um, uh, look, um, I appreciate you're dealing there with uh, with Tajikistan because uh, there is a question here from John Cook as to uh, as to the differences between there. And I see Kirill's got his hand up, so I I take it you want to address that. So mm. could you please? Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, very briefly, because uh, I actually quite enjoyed the Shokrat's original comment about. Uh, uh, Tajikistan diversion to action, so panic, Rahmon panicked. Uh, I uh, actually quite disagree. I believe uh, that uh, uh, Rahmon's uh, animosity towards the Taliban is very much a construct. It's uh, a verbal uh, discourse that he has been peddling for domestic consumption. It's his uh, self-aggrandizement move. He hasn't actually lifted a finger to help the son of Ahmad Shah Massoud who is uh, leading the National Resistance Front. There is no evidence that uh, Tajikistan is shipping weapons or doing something. It uh, simply is a continuation of Rahmon's vision of self-grandeur, that he is a spokesperson for the Tajiks worldwide, worldwide uh, not just in his own country, but in uh, what he calls Greater Khurasan, so it's uh, Afghanistan and Iran. And uh, what uh, makes me suspicious is that his uh, most fiery statement against the Taliban he used the figure of 44%. So according to him, 44% of the population of Afghanistan consists of the Tajiks, which is outlandish. This is completely untrue. This is just a, a speech act that, that uh, serves some kind of domestic agenda. Uh, the final point, actually, uh, I'm not into conspiracy theories, but I wouldn't be surprised at all that uh, at the latest uh, SCO summit in uh, Dushan. between Russia and China on the one hand and the Central Asian Republics on the other hand. So Tajikistan is a bad pop regionally, whereas uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan show sweet reasonableness and they're good pops. And at the moment, the good pop attitude is the dominant one, but if the Taliban prove to be stroppy, then um, uh, uh, Tajikistan will take the leadership position and perhaps will be used by the uh, bigger powers uh, to revive some kind of uh, uh, replica of the Northern Alliance. But it's in the worst case scenario. I don't see it happening, quite frankly, anytime soon. Okay, um, our, our next question is from Samantha Wong, who, uh, unless, did anybody else want to address that, those issues? No, our next question is from Samantha Wong. We have um, talked about um, humanitarian um, assistance uh, at some stage, but um, but there, there there's there one would think there is a very real um, danger here of uh, Taliban rule turning into a humanitarian uh, crisis that has knock on effects in the region. And Samantha asks uh, Johan in particular, how do you see Central Asian states or bigger actors like Russia? maybe China, jointly dealing with a potential humanitarian crisis spillover from Afghanistan into Central Asia. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I would say to start with, my impression is still that, that uh, you know, even most of these countries around here, even, not just the, the Central Asians themselves, but also you know, Russia, China, view in a way on, on Afghanistan. What they want is, you know, stability. They don't want this refugee flows or, and it's, when it comes to Russia, for instance, it's a bit interesting to see how they talk a bit differently compared, uh, depending on which audience it is. Yeah. I mean, domestically for the Russian audience, it's very clear that, you know, the Taliban, they will 
get this in order and then no 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 need to to worry but when they're talking to the central Asians, they try to scare them very much that you know this can be terrible for you and then all these things yeah with the refugees and the islamists uh, coming over and in, in these flows for instance um but but if you take that away I, I still see that there is a quite you know um, common view but but when it comes to, to, the, to the basics of this and it's this security no has the re its reason the same with, with china with the xinjiang and that this should not be be an, any, any safe havens there in, in afghanistan for, for them um but when it comes to to this um, joint approach i mean i still think maybe I mean, four of the five Central Asian countries, they have basically taken the same approach here now that, okay, we have we're starting these discussions with the Taliban, we hope for stability and, and that it will be okay. Yeah, so basically, Tajikistan is the only outlier. And I think Kirill had some interesting points here also about this. It's also a domestic issue here that you really show some kind of strength and, and uh, more importance here in to say if, if they can i think when it really matters i think often of course in specific national uh, worries or interests uh, tend to, to to dominate this this type of thing so i think or like like seeing some kind of general strategy for instance um, we talked about earlier here i think kirill mentioned the uh, or about SEO meeting and all that and if some people might even have interpreted that as some kind of you know maybe quite unrealistic yeah just by looking at you have India and Pakistan in, in that same organization so it's more I think it's more this kind of discussions and platforms but to, to think of a real wide and regional wide um, common strategy I think is, is uh, not realistic thank you very good. Does anybody else want to address that question? Just a brief comment on the humanitarian aspect of Central Asia and Afghanistan connection. Um, again, I think um, my comment will be on Uzbekistan. Uh, this country, as Kirill said, trying to um, conduct some independent policy in this regard and adding to my own comment that this nation is trying to secure good relations with Taliban. And it, in humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. I think that was uh, one of the rare aids that Taliban received without any conditions attached. But I'm assuming the condition was that Taliban will make sure that, I mean, previous agreement with Uzbekistan had with Taliban that they will not let anyone attack Uzbekistan from their territory. So there's um, Islamic groups with targeted on Uzbekistan and, uh, and um, securing the trade routes um, through, um, through Afghanistan. So um, yeah, this kind of small amount, of, and I think around 100 tons of humanitarian aid, including food staff, essential goods, medicine, clothing, and footwear, was sent. And I would assume that if international um, community starts sending more um, aid, Uzbekistan will increase its um, um, humanitarian aid by itself. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much. Unless anybody has anything else to add, I think we're going to call it. Um, to an end there. I've I've learned uh, quite quite a bit. Um, as somebody who, as I said, doesn't focus on this region uh, normally, um, I'm very glad. Uh, I, mean, I found this this discussion to be um, really quite interesting, and uh, I hope to see you all soon. Um, I know uh, three of you are in Canberra, so we, we may cross paths. Um, I do want to mention that tonight's event was put together by our interns, which is perhaps why you saw them popping up in the uh, in the the comments so often. Um, uh, the interns are Xanthi Murrell, Samantha Wong, Jake Murray, and Paul Alva. So I want to um, give them kudos and a big round of applause and a round of applause to our speakers as well. That was uh, a really interesting uh, talk. Um, and thank uh, you all out there watching us. Um, do go to internationalaffairs.org.au uh, and click on our events uh, bar to see what, what next is coming up. And if you're not a member of the AIIA, remember we are a membership organization. You can get access to, um, well, this one was free, but you can get access to all of our webinars for free um, 
uh, uh, if you are a member of the organization. And we accept tax deductible donations. So um, thank you everybody and good night. <laughs>